Hey guys, I was uh, walking around a Kia bar again, like I usually do, and I came across this little thing. Handheld black light requires four AA batteries. I thought for a 580 yen, not a bad impulse buy. So um, I picked one up, and here it is. So it's the usual sort of thing. Got an LED on the front, the tube on the side there. I'll turn the lights out and show you what it looks like. So we got the uh, LED there, and then if we turn the switch the other way, we get the black light. It's glowing a little bit more in real life than the camera because the camera's not so sensitive to ultraviolet. But yeah, you can see the glow there. So what we'll do, I'll quickly take it apart. I'll explain how the uh, the circuit inside works, and then we'll uh, find some things and see if we can make some stuff glow. So that thing came apart pretty easy. Usual cheap plastic molding, bit of a reflector for the ultraviolet there. So this is the interesting part. There's our black light, our UV tube, and our PCB. So they're four. Uh, AA batteries sitting here up against these contacts. We've got a transistor and a uh, transformer and a little oscillator circuit with some capacitors and resistors there for the tube. And then we've got a current limit resistor and LED there. That's for the uh, the white light, the LED light. Now on the back, you can see we've got some uh, exposed pads just here. This is a three position switch, just like in a, a multimeter. You've got the uh, metal tabs which press up against the PCB and slide around between the exposed metal there and just act as a switch. So it's pretty uh, pretty cheap and cheerful, but it, it's, it does a job, it works fine. So I did actually do a uh, schematic, and here it is here. So when we turn the switch to the left, our voltage flows from our AA batteries, 6 volts, through the LED, through our current limiting resistor, and down to ground. Easy stuff, one resistor, one LED, standard stuff. However, when we push it to the right, all of this comes into play. So what happens is, our voltage is coming in, the main current path is going to be down through this transformer, through the transistor, and down to ground. Also, once it's working, we're going to have it coming through the tube as well, and down to ground as well. But, to start with, we need to get this thing turning on and off. Because a transformer isn't going to work with DC, we need a pulsing a sine wave, or a, even a, in this case, a pretty dirty square wave. We need that to turn on and off, on and off really, really fast to get that pulsing, to get the the, uh, the transformer transforming. So what happens is, as this capacitor charges up, and it comes through here and this charges, we get a little pulse come through, and that will activate this trans transistor. It also charges these through this uh, capacitor. And this is an RC network, resistor and capacitor, RC. It oscillates at a frequency defined by the resistor and the capacitor. In this case, it's uh, 60 kilohertz. That's how fast it's turning this transistor on and off and hence turning on and off the uh, transformer. They use a high frequency because it's a lot more efficient and you can use a small transformer. That means uh, higher efficiency in the general circuit and lower cost because you've got a small transformer, less material, easy to make, all good all round. The al also the other function for this first little kick is to get the tube conducting. It's kind of like a relay in a sense when you have the uh, pull-in current and then a hold current. So if you imagine you've got a relay and you want to turn it on, click like this. You need a decent amount of current to pull that across and you know, create the magnetic force to close the contact. Once it's closed, you don't need nearly as much, maybe a quarter or a third of the current, to uh, actually hold that closed. And that's the difference between pull-in current, which is a lot higher, and holding current, which is what actually holds. It's the same with a tube. You need a decent kick to get across, but once it's conducting, it stays conducting a lot easier. So you need a lot lower current. So we get a little bit of a kick through here, and get that boom across. Then it, it's fine because it's, it's conducting, so it needs a lot lower current. And then this is oscillating, and it's creating its light, no worries. So we end up, in the end, when it's running, we've got a pulsing current down through here, and then also a higher voltage coming out to the tube. We're applying that high voltage across the tube, down through a current limiting resistor, just so we don't burn out the transformer, and out. This tube is actually running at about 160 volts, uh, peak to peak, or about 54 volts RMS, under normal operation. So that's how the uh, circuit works. Let's put this thing back together, and uh, make some things glow. Alright, so let's see if we can make some things glow. Well, actually this first thing doesn't actually glow, it's uh, a 3D printed part, just like a, a demo file, but it's made of UV reactive filament. So if I put that next to there, it doesn't 
fluoresce or anything, but it does actually change color. You might be able to see it there. It changes to purple with ultraviolet light. Obviously, the stronger the ultraviolet, the more it's going to change. And if you take the ultraviolet away, it will slowly turn back. Pretty cool. So let's turn out the lights. I've got a few things, um, and we'll uh, just play around and make things glow, eh? Okay, so I'm in the pitch black in my room, got all the lights turned off, except for the UV. So I walked around the house, waved this thing around, and found a few things that glow. So I got this, uh, this is obviously going to glow, because it's a uh, 3D printed frog, the Prusa sort of standard model, and it's made with, uh, with glow-in-the-dark filament. So if I turn the light off, you'll see there, glowing quite nicely, nice and bright. Then I found uh, this Dharma doll, which you can see it's like a, a pink, it's actually a pink, but when it fluoresces, it fluoresces orange. Some things do that. Minerals will do that as well. They'll look one colour in um, normal light and they'll fluoresce a completely different colour. A bit of electroluminescent wire as well. That's actually the sheath, not the uh, phosphor itself. The uh, the sheath is like a fluorescent-ish orange and that probably gives it more of a punchy colour when the uh, electroluminescent wire is turned on. Even uh, money. A lot of money. These are some Zimbabwean notes. Look at that one. What's that? That's a uh, 10 trillion dollar note. You can see it's glowing quite green. What's the, uh, what's this one? 50 billion dollars. It's uh, pretty hard to pick up on the camera but all this is glowing kind of orange. It's pretty dim on the notes. A hundred trillion dollars. Oh, you can see the serial numbers here. Maybe if I get the right angle. You can just see the orange there. One thing I was surprised about was the uh, American one dollar note. I mean, maybe they don't really care about the one dollar, but there's absolutely no fluorescence on the one dollar note at all. I don't know if this one's an old one. I only have a one dollar note. I don't have any um, high denominations. Maybe the hundred dollar bill would have some more uh, some more fluorescence. The Japanese. I've got a Japanese 5,000 yen there and a 1,000 yen. That's uh, $50 and $10 respectively. But you see the hanko here and here. The hanko is like the Japanese version of a signature. They have a little stamp that's carved and made so it's only that particular shape is that one made. Um, it's like a, it's very common. You see on like Japanese imported goods and stuff they have a hanko for the quality control stamp. But it's just like a Japanese signature. They're glowing and then over here there's a bit of bit of glow down the side here and around here. The um, even stamps. See this one's glowing but this is glowing because it was a special these were special stamps. They were deliberately printed with glow-in-the-dark ink. Look like that. These are Australian stamps. And then we've got uh, Uranium marbles. Look at that. These are actually uranium glass. They got uranium salt in them. Now it was a semi-common sort of thing. They used to make glassware, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago or so. You find it in antique stores. You walk around an antique store with a, a, a black light. See any kind of clear, slightly green tinted glass? It could be uranium glass. I also used to use it in, um, in the glazing. So you get like bright orange and it would glow really intensely under ultraviolet light. People collect this stuff. It's not actually radioactive any more than background radiation or a banana or a granite bench top. So it's safe, but it does have that really nice nuclear kind of radioactive glow. A lot of plastics as well. Like these, uh, li this lithium battery is uh, wrapped in a like a plastic heat shrink. It's clear, but it's glowing quite intensely white. Uh, pet bottles, like your, your Coke bottles, they all glow as well. And of course, paper is really bright. It's because they use a, a white phosphor in the paper to make it look really like that blue white, they're all clean, crisp white. Same stuff they use in uh, in washing powder. So when you wash your clothes, you walk out in the sunlight where it's uh, got that UV component in the sunlight and it will glow white. That's why when you walk into a nightclub with the black lights, all your shoelaces and your white buckles and your, your, your laces and all the stitching in your jeans and all that glows so white because it's a phosphor from your um, from your washing powder. So that's all the interesting kind of stuff that I found that would glow. Just bits of plastic, you know, glows. 
randomly around the place. So it's cool to get one of these things and just walk around the house and just see what you can find glowing. Anyway, that's all for this video. Don't forget we got that Patreon. Keep watching the videos and we'll see you next time.